Welcome everybody to the uh, online Ecopath seminar series, uh, which is obviously being brought to you by, uh, by the Ecopath Research and Development Consortium. Um, thank you very much for, for all of you that are attending and uh, for the people that, that are in the room, which is great to have actual, actual people in the room. Um, so just some housekeeping rules for those of you who are online and people in the room. <laughs> Uh, for, for, for people that are online, please make sure that your name is clear when you entered it into the, into the Zoom settings and when you ask a question. Um, and uh, try and use question in the Q&A for your question so that um, we can keep track, track of it so that I can ask it to Kieran afterwards. Um, and try and put your organization and country in because that helps uh, when we do that. Uh, if you have any technical questions, then please put it in the chat and, and I'll have a look at that as well. Um, and note that the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the EMB YouTube channel and on the Ecobot YouTube channel uh, eventually. For now, it'll just be on EMB because we are um, not able to go into the Ecobot YouTube channel from this side. Um, so yes, we're hosting it at the Marine Board uh, just because it's easier for me to do that way. I'm a little bit technically... Uh, and have, have what's the word I'm looking for? I'm I I, I don't really do it very well. Um, so the uh, series is basically held every two months on the last Tuesday of the month at 12 noon Eastern time, so Eastern US time. I think it's 9 a.m. in Vancouver, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 6 p.m. <coughs> in Brussels, and 7 p.m. in in uh, Thessaloniki, which is where we are at the moment. So today's seminar, and then we have two, um, uh, well, it's, as I said, every second, uh, every last um, Tuesday of the month. So the 30th of November and the 25th of January will be the next one. So today we have um, a speaker, Dr. Kieran Tierney. He is a researcher at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Uni University of Strathclyde. Um, Kieran did his PhD with me a while ago now. Um, and his PhD was on the fate of radionuclide discharge that, are, that were discharged by the Sellafield Nuclear Fuel Reprocessing Facility. And he used EcoTracer, which is a, a program, a routine that is part of the Ecopath of Ecosun Suite, which is why he's giving this talk. Uh, he's going to tell us about that work, but he's also going to be telling us, hopefully, about uh, two new projects that he's got um, just starting uh, using EcoTracer. One is called Modime, which is a modeling based exploration of the ecological effects of the Wakasio oil spill. And the second one is the R2K project, which is looking at uh, how to predict ecosystem uptake of discharges from a Swedish nuclear facility. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing and uh, Kieran uh, can take it away. Um, so thank you very much for um, asking me to present the Ecopath uh, seminar series. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so this is work that I did during my PhD, which was based at the Scottish University's Environmental Research Centre, but um, was also affiliated with the Scottish Association for Marine Science and working with, with Sheila. Um, it's really a story of, if any of you have looked at Ecotracer when you open up um, Ecopath, why it has this symbol. Um, so <clears throat> Jeroen kind of made this symbol during my PhD when I started working with, with Ecotracer. Um, and also at the same time, uh, Vili and, and Will Walter started developing some of the, the code and, and published paper at the same time, looking at, at Fukushima uh, discharges of, of radioactivity. Um, so this is the Sellafield Ecotracer model. And we published um, a paper on this model uh, 2018, and it brought together a, a big group of people, lots of different kind of backgrounds, um, whether it was in ecosystem modeling, um, also nuclear physics, radiochemistry, um, geologists, environmental science, and, and, um, and, and analytical chemists as well, actually. And it was a big uh, kind of project where we were looking at uh, a radionuclide called radiocarbon. So it's the radioactive uh, isotope of, of carbon. 
um, and it's discharged into uh, into the environment from uh, nuclear reprocessing facilities such as Sellafield. So this is a picture of Sellafield. This is what a, a Sellafield is. Um, and it's located on the northwest coast of the UK, um, sitting just on the Irish Sea. Um, Sellafield produces radiocarbon just during routine uh, processes and it is released uh, to, to the environment where because of its high bioavailability um, it behaves just like carbon in the environment and also because of its long half-life it's got half-life for almost 6,000 years it means that it, it isn't going anywhere um, and it moves into the, the biosphere and it is uh, able to transfer throughout the entire food chain which means that it's actually the, the radionuclide that provides the highest collective dose from the entire nuclear industry to human populations uh, around the world. So I'm going to go into a little bit of physics as to what is radiocarbon, but it is relatively simple. Uh, and the reason for that is because I wouldn't understand it otherwise. Um, so it is produced naturally. Um, that's how we can do radiocarbon dating. Um, and it's produced in the upper atmosphere, in the stratosphere and troposphere by uh, cosmic rays. Um, so cosmic rays cause a bombardment of neutrons onto nitrogen uh, atoms. And this causes um, the absorption of, uh, of a neutron in the nitrogen atoms. Uh, producing C14, um, kicking out a proton and uh, whilst it's doing that. Now C14 is a weak beta decay radionuclide, so that's why it has a very long half-life. What it means is that it actually takes a lot of C14 to be potentially radiologically significant. It's also produced during bomb testing. Um, I don't, it was in the 1950s and 60s uh, when there was atmospheric uh, nuclear testing, um, not that I'm advocating nuclear testing at Sellafield, um, and this doubled atmospheric C14 content at the time. But nuclear waste reprocessing is where the C14 I'm going to be talking about comes from. So it's produced and released um, through uh, atmospheric discharges. But it is also released at Sellafield through pipelines into the Irish Sea as inorganic C14. So it is discharged within the dissolved inorganic carbon pool. And this is particularly important um, in the last few years because marine discharges of C14 increased in, in 1994. So the figure here shows the atmospheric and marine discharges from Sellafield uh, annually. And in the 1990s, uh, scrubbers were attached to the flumes um, at Sellafield to recirculate C14. And it was then released through marine uh, aquatic releases rather than from the atmospheric discharges. Now, once it enters the marine environment, uh, I hypothesize that it is going to be uh, uptaken by photosynthesizing organisms because it will behave just as any carbon, any dissolved carbon within the marine environment. And so it's then able to enter the marine food web. And of course, it can also build up within uh, sediments from fallout. Um, and then in calcifying organisms as well uh, during shell formation. Um, the, the calcifying um, process was actually a paper that we, we published some work on that in 2016. Um, now, I mentioned here there's northward transport um, of C14 once it enters the Irish Sea, um, and that's due to the general circulation that exists within this environment. So this is where we are. Um, so a map of 
most of uh, the UK and Ireland. Sellafield is roughly where the red dot is. And during this project, we sampled a, a, a number of sites collecting uh, biota and water. I'm mainly just going to be talking about three here. So this is a site in the eastern basin of the Irish Sea, or EB, which is located quite close to where the pipelines come out. Um, one in the West Basin, which is a, a slightly deeper body of water, um, Isle of Man sits in the middle. Um, and then the North Ch Channel, which is a deep, uh, deep narrow body of water that goes up to the, the West of Scotland. And um, we had another uh, main sampling site just off the side there. Um, so we've had water samples, biota samples, uh, the biota, included a, a variety of, of organisms um, and also we had a, a number of uh, marine mammal uh, samples that we, we published in a, another paper which showed uh, C14 transfer through the entire uh, food web up to uh, it was harbour porpoises and seals which are our main kind of resident mammal species that we get around the UK. So the model um, actually used was a repurposed model of the Irish Sea that was published by Lees and Mackinson in 2007. The model was developed from 1973 and that suited us because Sellafield has been discharging radiocarbon into the Irish Sea since the late 1950s, early 1960s. Um, what we did was we, we edited the model a bit, reduced the number of functional groups just to simplify it slightly. Um, there was a, a publication, a thesis on um, incorporating better description of marine mammals within this model as well. And so we incorporated that into this um, and following the pre uh analytical tests, um, we made some other um, relatively minor uh, edits to, to this model. And it wasn't fitted to time series data. We decided that uh, a model that described environment for that particular time was good enough for the questions that we were trying to answer. Um, this was effectively a, a feasibility study. Can we use the uh, ecotracer, can we use the ecopath approach and ecotracer to be able to um, capture what is happening with, with C14 in this environment? Uh, so this is the, the food web that we ended up with. So it's still a relatively complex food web. Um, number of functional groups, as well as several species that were um, that were described within it as well. I'm not going to try and explain that because you won't really be able to read it. We generated a um, map for Ecospace that was on a five kilometer, um, five by five kilometer grid. Um, what this meant was that there were some areas um, in the west of Scotland. So in the, the bottom here is Irish Sea with the Isle of Man sort of sitting in the middle. We have the North Channel um, heading up to the towards the top left of the map and then this is into the sort of west of Scotland area. And in here we lost some definition because of the, the map resolution. So some of the, the islands aren't, um, for example, they aren't uh, well defined here. Some of them are actually joint land. Um, so, so this was something that we considered, but we thought, given that the Irish Sea itself was our main focus area and um, for the questions we're trying to answer for the West of Scotland in terms of the general um, extent of C14 transfer and, and uptake in this sort of more far field area, we thought it would be good enough um, for what we were trying to do. Uh, we got hydrodynamic data from Copernicus, um, and this is then what we used as um, for dispersion of, of C14 within the model area. So we had a point source um, located just off of where Sellafield is within this map, and it was here that we had our contaminant input into uh, within the Ecotracer. We then used this advection data, which was on a, a monthly time step, uh, to disperse the C14 inputs into the model. 
this um, was depth averaged data. Um, and again, this was something that we, we considered at the time, but we thought this was probably going to still provide us with a good enough uh, dispersion uh, model and good enough prediction power to get the answers that, that we needed uh, for, what, um, for what it was we were looking at. In terms of uh, ecotracer input, I'm not sure if you can um, see this too well, but I'll, I'll go through it relatively slowly. Um, <clears throat> within ecotracer, you, you, your initial box allows you to put in a, a concentration, an existing concentration of contaminant within the environment. For us, this wasn't um, important. This wasn't something we need to use because we made up a driver file. So there's a, a box that lets you load up um, an Excel sheet and CSV sheet. And with that, you can input contaminant data for a specific grid square or multiple grid squares within your uh, model environment um, on whatever chosen type, time steps that you're using, whether that's yearly or in this case, we were doing monthly time steps. And um, you could also do this via a, for a forcing function, um, depending on uh, what kind of data that you have, whether or not that's, that's something that would be useful to you. Um, there are decay rates that you can add in here as well. Now, we could put a decay rate in for radiocarbon, but it's got a half-life of almost 6,000 years, and we weren't covered in that sort of period length of time, so um, we, didn't, we didn't need to put that in for us. Um, we decided to go with having a, effectively a clean environment where no radiocarbon exists, which is obviously not true, as I already told you, it's produced naturally. But in this case, what we're interested in, what was the increased radiocarbon concentration within different species groups as a result of releases from Sellafield? And so for that, we decided to keep all our initial concentrations to zero. Um, our main or only route for uptake into the food web is absorption uh, or uptake by primary producers. And we base this on actual primary productivity rates for the three primary producers in our system. Um, so that was phytoplankton, microflora and seaweed. Uh, like I said, we didn't include any decay rates because of the, of the period of time that we were considering. Um, proportion of contaminant excreted and metabolic decay rates, they come for, from our ecopath um, input data. So radiocarbon is going to behave just like any carbon, um, just like any energy that's flowing through the system. So a proportion of contaminant excreted can be um, the same as you'd have in your basic inputs. Um, in terms of your excretion rates and the metabolic decay rate was then um, we utilized the what ecopath estimated for respiration rates in your ecopath output um, and we were able to test this which has made c14 quite a a good um a good contaminant as it were to to look at what, what ecotracer is capable of doing so we had a, a, a specific environmental concentration um, that we kept constant, and we had this, these absorption rates and these metabolic decay rates, and we could see that the concentration in any one functional group, particularly for our primary producers, that they flatlined. Um, so that meant that we knew that our uptake and our removal from groups was equal. Um, so C14 is behaving like carbon, it's not going to bioaccumulate, it's not going to concentrate in any specific group. Um, uh, so I'll show you a video of the actual environmental concentrations within uh, Ecotracer once this has been uh, input in and using the Copernicus uh, hydrodynamic data to force this within the model. Um, so our model started in the 1980s and I'll, in 1984-5, and I'll run this again. Um, and even though the model data 
um, or sorry, the, the actual discharge data um, for cellophane shows releases going back into the 60s. We didn't have uh, hydrodynamic data going back that far. So that's what we used as our start point for this. Our main interest was what happened um, coming into the 2000s when uh, cell field discharges were hitting their sort of highest uh, highest concentrations. And then when we were actually going out and uh, sampling and analyzing um, biota, which were samples that were, were taken in 2014. So I'll run this again. <clears throat> so we have our, our releases in the eastern basin of the Irish Sea um, in concentrations ranging from, from one into uh, over 10,000 becquerels. Um, so our measurements are all in activities and they're in activities per kilogram of carbon. Um, we could have used carbon um, just as a, for our initial masses within Ecopath, but we, we kept it as biomasses. And instead what we did was we, we just recalculated our, our outputs um, afterwards. You can see that once we had the higher releases from Sellafield, that the activities um, were increasing in areas in the west of Scotland, um, up towards the top of the map. But we're already even at this point seeing that they were potentially not as high as what we were actually uh, observing in, in our analysis. Um, what we started looking at was the um, base dispersal rate within ecospace. So if you look in ecospace for different functional groups, you can set a, a base dispersal, dispersal rate for them. And for a contaminant, uh, the base dispersal rate is connected to whatever value you assign for your first group after uh, detritus. So typically uh, one of your primary uh, producers like phytoplankton. Um, what we found was that, um, so advection is the dominant control on, on dispersion in our model, but we could use the base dispersal rate to still have an impact on it, acting as a sort of likelihood function for movement of the contaminant to the border and cells. Um, by increasing it to a minimum of 100 kilometers per month, we were able to get the kind of typical uh, dispersion that has been seen in the Irish Sea. We actually had to double it um, to 200 kilometers a month to sort of see the, the range and environmental concentrations that had been measured in the Eastern Irish Sea um, during the, the 90s up until 2000, which is really the only kind of consistent set of uh, time series data that, that had existed for this area. And it was because we were able to get that sort of range um, of activities in the model that uh, matched what had been observed that we decided that was the best sort of model run that we would use that dispersion rate for um, going forwards. <clears throat> so going into some actual results based on using the, these uh, model runs, um, so we had samples that were collected in, in June 2014 from the Eastern Basin within the Irish Sea. And the observed data are the, the black uh, columns on the figure. The uh, sort of darker grey um, columns is uh, the model data from our sort of best run, this 200 kilometres per month. And so it, the data here is, is showing the, the net C14 activity for different functional groups. Um, so for example, um, our epifaunal macrobenthos, where, where we had sampled maybe different brittle stars and starfish, we agglomerated uh, uh, that data to provide a, a single value, which we then compared with the model data. And what we found was that the model was, was given as really good predictions. I think quite typically when you see this 
data you may see it on uh, log scales and we were really comfortable just showing this um, on a normal scale um, because the the values are so so close it's almost quite surprising and we weren't we weren't fitting to this or anything we were just fitting to some of the environmental data like i showed you before um, and we were managing to capture uh, these predictions for this this particular area and bear in mind the, the model data is just giving you an, an average value for a, a five by five kilometer uh, grid, whereas we're obviously sampling just from that one kind of specific point. Um, the other thing that the model showed was this observed trend of increasing activities with higher trophic levels. Um, and when we collected the data, we had to sort of pinch ourselves and look at this a couple of times because there was obviously, we, we, we knew that you would get no accumulation, no bioaccumulation of C14. It, it should be behaving like normal carbon. Um, however, when we got heard back from Sellafield in terms of what they had released at that point in time, we saw that they, um, when we happened to be out on the boat, uh, they released one of their lowest uh, concentrations of, of C C14 uh, for several years. Um, what we're actually seeing is time integrated activities um, that are defined by diet and lifespan of different species. So species at higher trophic levels that are feeding higher up within the, the system and usually live in a bit longer. The C14 activity that they're going to exhibit within their tissues is going to actually be representative of C14 that has been in the environment over a number of months, potentially even, even years, depending on the tissue that you're sampling um, and, and the species that you're, that you're looking at. Um, and obviously when you're looking at it from a, a modeling perspective and you've got your, your time steps within a model, it makes sense that a model would replicate that in some way. Um, but we definitely think that the ECOPATH uh, EWE approach and the data that's required, the ecological data, the diet the information and stuff that's going into this, it really helps, particularly when looking at something like C14, which is going to be behaving like normal carbon. We move over to the, the West Basin, so we're sort of intermediary um, site, and it gets a bit more mixed, and it's really a result of having um, really highly variable uh, data that we collected from the site. Um, we're now, I think, also starting to see potential issues with uh, the, the dispersion um, within our model and, and, and uh, using Ecopath to do our, our dispersion. I'll talk about that in a little bit, a little bit later. Um, again, the general trends of higher activities with higher trophic levels that, that we observed um, where we're replicated with the model. And where there was um, maybe two or three uh, functional groups which showed very, diff very different observed uh, activities compared to model, there is some ways we can explain this if considered the Infauna polychaete group. Um, this included uh, a highly predatory species, uh, Aphrodite, which the measurements um, of that species alone had activities of, of several hundred becquerels, whereas other smaller uh, polychaetes, their activities were well below 100 becquerels and actually showed a value that was much more similar to uh, the model. Um, there could also be an element of fish species like dab that are moving around about in the, the Irish Sea a little bit more and, and maybe been feeding in a, an area that slightly more active and, and kind of coming over. So again, it just kind of shows the importance of how species and such are defined within a, within a model. When we head up to a, a far field site in the, in the North Channel, um, and our model activities are significantly below what was observed um, when we go to higher trophic levels, we are in the sort of right ballpark. We are in the same um, order of magnitude, but at lower trophic levels, uh, that wasn't the case at all. It looks like the way we did the dispersion uh, within the model um, 
it wasn't it wasn't the best way potentially doing it here. We depth averaged um, the hydrodynamic data, and where you have areas like the North Channel, which is which is a particularly deep uh, body of water uh, relative to the area, you do have multiple currents that, that can be running in this area, and so you may have um, a high. Uh, dispersion of, of C14 going northward, but it may have been getting cancelled out a bit in the model um, with currents, residual currents that are moving southwards from the Atlantic Ocean. And so we may have been caught out a little bit by attempting to model uh, in this way and could have been uh, better using a, a 3D um, a physical transport model instead. Uh, just another little video. This time show the differences between a species at a lower trophic level, so zooplankton with uh, one of our uh, species at higher uh, trophic level, uh, harbour porpoises. Are. And I'm just trying to highlight this idea of the, the time integrated activities that we're capturing. So on the side that has our, our zooplankton functional group, we can see that the C14 activities are, are changing a lot, they're very highly variable as the environmental concentrations are, are varying quite quickly. But that isn't the case with harbour porpoises. Now there have been sites in the past um, that people have studied C14 and conclusions have been made at some of these sites that it is reasonable to use environmental concentrations and by using environmental concentration you can then get a, a, an estimation for what you would, um, what you think the activities should be in, uh, in some species. Um, what we found both as in our observations and when we we're out doing the sampling work, um, and then what we're capturing the model is that in a highly um, with a contaminant that's highly varying in its concentration, um, and well, particularly specifically to C14 in this case, that's quite clearly not the case. Um, things like the longevity, the lifespan of uh, the species in question and its data are going to be so important with regards to what this activity could be at a point in time. You could see very low environmental activities, um, whereas you have an organism like a fish or a marine mammal within that environment, which is exhibiting quite a high activity. The figure um, on the left here is just model data really kind of illustrating that point um, where you have this really highly variable uh, activities and dissolved in organic carbon. So this is our environmental data that we're pulling out of the model um, and zooplankton, which is sort of following it relatively closely um, at these different sites. But then when you move through uh, the food web up to organisms at higher trophic levels, we have a much more kind of smoothed out activities for these organisms. Um, this is something that we said in a publication we made on the data that we collected for the west of Scotland and for the North Channel, where we saw some higher activities there uh, compared to some parts in the Irish Sea, given that we, we expected that there must have been a spike of activities in the west of Scotland when there had been a spike in discharges uh, from Sellafield, which may have resulted in, in higher activities um, being incorporated into tissues of some organisms, which were then not apparent in organisms towards the top, uh, towards the bottom of the food chain, uh, like zooplankton. Uh, so just to go into some conclusions from what we found by uh, using Ecotracer to try and uh, model the system. So we do think that it is a tool that can be used to provide reasonable predictions for C14 uptake and transfer through the, the food web. And they're significantly assisted by ecological data utilised by the EWE approach. Um, I think I, I kept going back to this, the time integrated activity, which you, you can't capture through other uh, modeling means as, as easily as, as seems to be apparent for using the ecopath approach. Um, and the other nice thing is uh, there are so many ecopath models for various environments out there 
and they can be redeveloped and used for contaminant tracing, whether that's uh, routine discharges like we were looking at here, or whether there's an incident that occurs in uh, one particular area. Um, it's really important to consider how you approach modeling the, the contaminant dispersion. So we showed here that for the immediate area uh, from where the, the releases were being made at Sellafield, we did appear to, to capture uh, what was happening with C14 really well. But as we moved further and further away, the approach we took was probably not the best approach. And if we had maybe used like a 3D uh, physical transport model, and that may have meant that uh, we would have got a better quality um, predictions for, for other areas. And then obviously you need to think about your species um, and your ecopath model going right back to your, your basic input. Um, you're not going to get accurate data out for, for a functional group that describes species with um, very different ecologies um, like we had with, uh, with our polychaetes. Um, I'm continuing to work in Ecotracer, so I'm currently at the University of Strathclyde, but I'm moving back to where I, I did my PhD uh, in November to the Scottish University's Environmental Research Centre, and I'm working on two different projects. One of these is um, a sort of very similar to what I did for, for Sellafield, and this is looking at, at C14 discharges from a, a Swedish nuclear power, uh, power plant into the, the Kattegat, so between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea, um, but also uh, looking at other contaminants, so for example oil, and last year you may have heard that there was a, an oil spill off the coast of Mauritius when the MV Wakashio hit a, uh, hit a reef, and so I'm involved in a sort of larger group looking at um, the dispersion of that oil and, and the effects that it may have had. And we're, we're going to try and bring that into an, an ecopath and an ecotracer model of that area as well. Oh, uh, so thank you. And if you have any questions and if any of that, I'm quite happy to answer them. Thank you uh, very much, Kieran. Uh, Natalie, have you got a hand? So you get to go first, Natalia. <laughs> Thank you, Kiran. I was uh, was nice. I heard that background of this presentation many times, and every time I have pages of notes. So, <laughs> especially now, then I am trying to understand it more deeply because I'm planning to use it. Uh, I do have several questions. One is right at the beginning, and these are technical questions. Mm -hmm. You said then that the absor absorption rates. Uh, the for the, you change just for phytoplankton, yeah, and that is the the equivalent of a turnover rates. How you get that? You said it, but I just missed it. So for C fourteen, um, carbon the carbons in C fourteen is going to behave exact same as any stable form of carbon. Yeah. Um, and so as a result of that, we know that the uptake rate of it is going to be the equivalent of um, the photosynthesizing um, organism. So at the rate that, for example, your, your phytoplankton are photosynthesizing, then whatever concentration of C14 is available um, within the DIC pool, that is how much they are going to then uptake. Um, so for C14, going to be particularly specific for that and actually makes it quite easy to estimate an, an, an uptake rate for. So it's quite a quite a good contaminant in that, in that case for, for doing so this. So you use a normal uptake rate of carbon? Yes. And then I do have other questions. <laughs> uh, I, I really like the, I think that is quite important, the fact that you add uh, observations that you use for validation so you can set the dispersion rates to try to figure out how much is the dispersal rate to validate what is in the environment. And that is very important. Uh, uh, you said that there is not uh, accumulation for this kind of uh, uh, radiocarbon, but also then the radioactivity uh, was increasing with trophic level. Mm -hmm. So somehow there is a kind of uh, accumulation, I don't know if accumulation yeah. is the right word, yeah, no, that, that's right. So um, so it's what I was saying was 
we're, we're getting a time integrated activity for some organisms. Um, and it's just basically based on their turnover rates and their um, their diets. Those are kind of the key kind of components there. So we're measuring um, the C14 concentration within the muscle tissue, and they're only going to be releasing C14 depending on, um, so there'll be respiration, but then also the degradation or turnover of, of cellular mass um, that's happening in those tissues. Um, but if you have, um, so there'll always be carbon that's turning over within your own system. So there'll be a, a remnants of some th things that you ate several months before still within your tissues somewhere significantly later. So that was why we were seeing for um, organisms further up the food chain um, that their activities could be even orders of magnitude above the environmental concentration at that point in time. Um, we got a nice paper out based on our marine mammal um, data on that, I think it was the 2017 paper, and we were able to show that the, so the, the activities in a stranded um, harbour porpoise on the, the UK coastline um, were significantly linked to what cellophile discharges had been two years prior. Um, and what was nice was that within the Irish Sea, we could say that the activity in that animal was linked to what the releases from cellophile were between zero and 24 months prior to when it died. But if it was an animal that stranded on the west coast of Scotland, it was between 12 and 36 months before. Okay. And even though we knew that there was genetic mixing between the west of Scotland porpoises and the Irish Sea porpoises, we were then able to say that, so you may have some boys moving up and down and mixing. They're not feeding in the areas that they're maybe moving into. They've probably got really high forage fidelity for, you know, whether they're Irish Sea animals or west of Scotland animals. Thank you. And I do have a last no, question. No, 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 you not allowed? no, no, Vili's got his hand up. You can't have all the time. Go ahead. <laughs> I am actually wanted to do this just to demonstrate that I can get Natalia to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know how difficult that is. Thank you very much, Karen. It was uh, it was great to hear about uh, the projects which I knew about and the two new ones that I look forward to hearing much more about. Um, for for this kind of modeling, there's an issue that the water in in the models where that kind is where that is modeled moves with time unit of seconds, and we're using months in the standard aerospace model, the ones with time series. And that connection there between the hydrodynamic models and the ecosystem models is an area that um, really needs a lot of consideration and we need to work with good hydrodynamic models. I think that's, that's quite clear. Lots of things have happened there. What's your experience of the uh, You've been using output from monthly output, average monthly outputs from models. Uh, so what kind of issues did you encounter there? We saw, I think we saw some more with, with the North Channel, more yep. clearly than for, than for two others, but what's your experience here? Um, um, my general experience was, my main thought or issue wasn't necessarily so much using month average, because I think you're still going to capture um, the, the kind of general current system that will exist in, in, in large bodies of water. I think if you were focused, so particularly, I guess, on the west of Scotland with a lot of the um, sea locks and narrow, narrow channels, um, there will be um, effects in there that, that are not going to be getting captured. But I think that the main issue was the potentially the depth averaging of data. And where we have a body of water like the East Basin within the Irish Sea, which has a depth of an average of around about 30 metres, and there's, um, there's not really anywhere with any kind of significant, significant depth, but then you hit an area just north of it in the North Channel, um, and that's the, the kind of main route for 
um, contaminants that are in the Irish Sea for, for moving out of it, for the, the marine kind of dispersion route. And you have a really kind of mixed current regime within that um, kind of deep, um, narrow strait with currents that are um, moving at, at different directions at higher and, and lower areas. It's, you know, you're not going to capture them um, when you're, you're depth averaging um, data, especially, I guess, on these kind of longer time steps. And at worst, what you might be doing is just sort of flatlining your, your advection. So even though we still got a general northward movement, it probably wasn't strong enough within our, our model to kind of capture what the reality was beyond the Irish Sea. Yeah, we've seen something uh, of that here for um, modern state of Georgia, where uh, Greg Oldfog has, has developed a um, hydronomic model and ecosystem model. And it's showing actually, once you get, once you have that model with, with fine times that you can get a lot of dynamics around fine structures, sm islands, small openings and so on that, uh, that is really important to capture for, for the other model. So this whole, I think it's really important that we have this cooperation between the higher dynamic models yeah. and that they, um, to provide the, the water flow basically with all, how we do that and, and how we get, in, in your case, how we get the dispersal right, I think is really one of the things that, uh, we, that we need to work, work much more, uh, much more with. Yeah, but uh, it's great to see this cooperation. It's, I'll just add, it's, it's one of the approaches we're going to try and take with the Mauritius project. So we're linked up with um, NOAA and um, we're going to try and do the actual oil dispersion from the ship based on one of the, the NOAA models. And then we'll feed that into an ecopath model using the spatial temporal framework rather than using the framework to um, for our advection data and then, and then feed in the um, contaminant in from a point source. For uh, for some other work here that I was uh, involved in, which had to do with small coming out of the, of the Fraser River and dispersing there, where we we're looking at the fine scale, I uh, simply ran echo space with daily time steps, so two hour time steps. As you know, I went uh, in the end, I went down to twelve hour time steps. Um, and that means that, which means every hour a new field, because the type of cycle, cycle was really important for that. And I could, I could imagine for oil spills where you're talking about a run length of that's in days or weeks. I ran for a month um, for that model. I think it's worth considering. Yeah. The ch changing the unit, and if you if you make it twelve hour time steps. Um, it fits in, you can read for every hour, you can read in a new field. And I think much of the fine dispersal would be captured much better uh, in such, uh, by such a setup. It was straightforward to set this up. Uh, I, uh, we were only, I was only using tidal currents. Uh, so it was, it was fairly simple in this case here. I'm not wanting to request the question from Christy. And, um, no, it wasn't. It was, uh, it was just a few days work. Uh, okay. to, to set this up and, and to get a, few days, a few days work for Vili, which is like five months for us. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the main thing there was uh, what took time was rather to figure out how what should, what to do uh, to end up with that hourly time step. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know this this ended up being quite a nice eva evaluation of if this was impact of a terminal on, on water currents and so on. Uh, and mainly showing that this area we were looking at was dry half the time because the tides and, and how that influenced the mixing of the, of the small. But setting it up was uh, pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I think, Christy, I don't know if you have another question. I think we've, we've made you co-host now, so you should be able to show your, your video. Oh, okay, maybe we haven't done that yet. Um, yeah, I um, but Natalia, do you want to go uh, with your other questions if you haven't? Yes, thank you. 
I was scared to raise my hands. No? <laughs> a simple question, really. Uh, we, you said that we can expect uh, to have a uh, good output for functional groups when they are very diverse, like polychaetes. Uh, if you could back in past and do it all over again, would you simplify the model even more or would you do the opposite, just have more functional group to better represent them? It, it, there, would, there would be a combination of both. I think there would be some things that would be simplified more and other things that we would maybe try and, and look at pulling out more detail. Um, I think if I was going to do it again, I would try and convince all the analytical chemists that I was working with that actually only need to spend a year with them and I need to spend two or three years on actually the modeling rather than the other way around. <laughs> but, um, but the nice thing was the... Like I was only able to show some of the data um, there that, that we were then using um, to look at uh, the output from the model. But I think we generated more data on this um, particular uh, thing on, on C14 in our environment than, um, than has been generated before. Um, and, and it is going to be a particularly important thing for a lot of areas. So obviously I'm, I'm now going to be working with um, Swedish Radiation Authority because they are now interested in, in what is happening with their C14 in the environment. And it's, it's because all kind of um, nuclear nations, they have a huge um, inventory um, of, of radiocarbon. Um, the UK has over 200,000 tonnes of um, graphite bearing really high levels of C14, which we need to be able to sort of safely lock away for thousands of years. Um, and, and because of different regulations, different policies, um, and some of them maybe Sheila will be aware of as well, but the, um, it means that like these nations are being told that none of that can ever get into the marine environment. Um, it doesn't matter whether you can see it's not going to cause any real damage or not. Um, there's, there's still a lot of unknowns, you know, within radiochemistry. So and people are not willing to take any of these risks. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kieran. So there's a question from Tofu Zeglo. Um, he has a question on the concentration of radiocarbon. Is there a difference between pelagic fish and benthic fish in this context? Um, and is there an impact on migratory fish? That's actually uh, that's quite a nice question. Um, well, nice, it's not easy. Uh, there, we found that there was a difference in that um, we saw increases um, in pelagic, the activities within pelagic fish before demersal fish. Um, so if there was a, a spike in um, releases from Sellafield, then pelagic fish would uh, the, the, their activities were going to increase first because I guess they're closer to um, feeding on zooplankton and, or and which are feeding on phytoplankton um, compared to demersal fish. Um, some of our demersal uh, fish species um, when we're measuring the west of Scotland um, also quite typically actually had some, some really low activities like um, we had samples of monkfish which I think um, registered almost near background Whereas um, there was maybe species like whiting, which had activities that were um, several hundred becquerels above what was background. So there's, a, yeah, so the, the, there's lots of different things probably going on there. Um, migratory fish would be interesting. So we, we made a point of not looking at other marine mammals because we wanted to see what were the activities of, of species which were which were resident, which were always going to be in that area. Um, in terms of um, migratory fish, I think it would be a similar thing where they may pick up a little bit of C14 as they're passing through, and they may that may remain within their system for a little while, but then when they're, they're feeding elsewhere, that's going to be lost relatively quickly. Um, we did start looking at um, otoliths from uh, cod and haddock um, from the Celtic Sea to try and see if there was um, any kind of, we could see the, any migration from the Irish Sea into 
other fish stocks of for these species. And it was rather kind of inconclusive. Um, the activities just maybe weren't high enough to be able to kind of show that. Thank you very much, Kieran. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions, but I think we're kind of at the end of our hour. So uh, any other questions from anybody? If not, uh, I want to thank you all. Thank you very much, Kieran. That was great. Um, it's good to hear about the other projects and it'll be interesting to hear how you get to, to actually model the, um, the circulation or the, the dispersal of oil and how you get to bring that into the ecosystem. I'm, I'm quite I'm interested to see how, how you get that into the food web. Um, it, it would be interesting to see. So uh, if there isn't anything else, I will remind you that the next uh, webinar will be in November. Uh, I've forgotten the date now. Um, and we will let you know again through uh, Facebook and, and so forth of uh, when you can register for that. And this time I'll try to do it quicker. <laughs> Vili, you look like you want to say something, one last word. We can't hear you. No? No? <laughs> All right, so if, with, uh, if there's nothing else, then I just want to thank Kieran and thank uh, everybody else who came online. And uh, yes, we will uh, keep this on the YouTube channel, both Ecopath and Marine Board. So if anybody's interested, um, we will, you can see it there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank all. you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye.